My name is Dawn Miker. I'm a nurse practitioner with Columbia County Health Systems. Um, been with us since 2008. Uh, did primary care at the Waitsburg Clinic most, most of my career here. And then a year ago, a little over a year ago, I got to take over our population health department. And population health includes several programs that Columbia County Health Systems has. And we're going to give you an opportunity to meet all those programs if you like to. Um, palliative care is in-home care of people with chronic illnesses. We are not hospice. A lot of people kind of mix that word up. We're not hospice. But palliative care, we have two RNs um, that, that do amazing care in-home. Um, so Teresa Iyer uh, right here is one of our palliative care nurses. One of our other programs that really started this event right here is called Partners Improving Patient Health. We were lucky enough to get a HRSA grant, it's a federal grant, um, that helped produce things like this and helped us start a program that's disease management specific. So cardiovascular disease and pulmonary or lung disease is what we've been going for. So we're just gonna give a little presentation here, um, kind of the details about COPD that you may not know. Um, and then we'll just give you time to take your little bingo card Go around, visit all of our tables. There's handouts, there's little freebies and stuff running around. They'll stamp your card. Once your bingo card is filled out, if you miss someone, don't worry about it. Go ahead and turn in your bingo card. You do not have to fill it out 100% and see every person to turn it in. And we've got some beautiful gifts um, up here. Okay, we're gonna put it in there and Stephanie will draw something out and we will um, give away three gift baskets with kind of wintertime COPD kind of stuff in them. We also have some headsets. All of us get a little bit harder of hearing. They're Bluetooth that work with a lot of your computers and um, televisions so you can hear better. So, all right, we'll run right in. So welcome to our event. Um, let me know if suddenly you can't hear me if I get a little bit farther away from the mic. So COPD is definitely a process. Um, it's some degeneration of the lungs. COPD, as you probably know, stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Yeah, so pulmonary meaning lungs, obstruction, some way that is, is just making it hard for the blood flow and the oxygen exchange and the air exchange. Um, some of the things that, uh, obviously smoking is still the number one. Um, but a lot of our air pollution is also a big cause of it. Um, as as you, youth, it can be impaired lung growth, but it accelerates. All of us have some decline, and really, if we live long enough, we'll have a little touch of COPD no matter what. Um, but lung injury, having a big pneumonia, having a traumatic punctured lung, surgery on a lung, all those things can cause it. Um, it's inflammation of the lungs as well, especially with um, asthma and chronic bronchitis. There's an inflammation process that can be in there making it very difficult for the lungs to function. Symptoms in the small airways is where the air um, comes in, sending oxygen into the blood. The blood sends out carbon dioxide and we breathe it out. That exchange of gases becomes damaged. A Couple of different kinds we'll go through but emphysema and bronchitis are the two most common. Even though they're still COPD and we still have the same symptoms, they are somewhat different. We'll go through that a little bit more. And there are some impacts on the rest of the body systems, especially the heart. And as you can see from our pig lung and heart, the blood comes from the body, it goes through the right side of the heart, then it goes out to the lungs and does its thing and it comes back to the heart to go out to the body. So we've got the lungs between the two sides of the heart. You got bad lungs, you're probably gonna end up kind of straining that heart after a while. Emphysema, this is kind of the dry kind. The airways, the little teeny tiny sacs that fill with air and have a lot of blood flow around them called the alveoli, those end up getting um, stretched out, they kind of explode they bind with other ones. And instead of having these really great functional little um, cells in there, we have big ones, they're dilated, we call that hyperinflated that you'll see on an x-ray. And those lungs just don't squeeze down anymore. So they don't have a lot of that elasticity that we used to have. 
The other kind is more the chronic bronchitis. This is your smoker's cough when we get up in the morning, those wet coffee type um, bronchitis. It can be from asbestos damage. It can be from genetics. Some people are just more inclined damage to the lungs through the years. And that's more that kind of wet, more likely to have phlegm and the icky stuff. That's a medical term I get to use, icky stuff. OK, so we still have um, airflow limitation is still the end. And the needs are system management. We prevent you have from having those exacerbations and getting worse. And we try to make sure the rest of your body is healthy. So what are our risk factors? Obviously, smoking, as we talked about. And a lot of the air pollution, um, being downwind or you know living near some kind of industrial plant, living in cities, we're kind of blessed. Our air is better out here than living in the cities. But you know, the old I was raised near Los Angeles, so you know, damage was done in my early years. Smoking we covered is still the main cause. I'm having trouble. Sorry. Working living near chemicals, also mines. Obviously, the black lung of the coal miners was a big one. Uh, firefighters have a lot because they have um, exposures to that. But also dust. Our agricultural industry has a lot of dust. Um, automotive things like uh, diesel. Diesel has a lot of particulates in the exhaust. They're getting better as, as you know technology helps. but. Diesel mechanics, uh, asbestos is in, in brake pads. So guys who worked in the um, uh, automotive industry, and especially brakes, paint fumes, but that harsh chemicals can also damage the lungs through the years. A lot of occupational fumes, air pollution, especially burning fossil fuels, wood, coal, things like that. And advanced age, unfortunately, we get older, things don't work quite as well. So. We get a little older, it gets a little worse, and there are genetic conditions. You know, some of us, you know, people who can smoke their whole life never get COPD. Others smoke for three years and they've got asthma. So, and there's our asthma. All right, good little picture of the lungs, the type. Um, asthma is one of the ones that starts earlier. It does have more inflammation than we even knew of before. And all those asthma attacks through the years do cause damage in the long run. So they cause inflammation and narrowing of those airways. And you get wheezing, that wonderful whistling sound. And as we get older, it gets harder to reverse it with our rescue inhalers. The emphysema, as we talked about, hyperinflation, it's hard to press all that air out of the lungs. So occupational can show us some breathing techniques like purse lip breathing. A little back pressure can help that air get back out of the lungs. And then chronic bronchitis, we got to manage all that cough and all that mucus that everybody's stuck with. So the experience of COPD, as you guys know, is shortness of breath. You know, it may just be with heavy activity and exercise, or it may continue to go worse until you're having it even when you're just sitting. Uh, and that is no fun. People may notice earlier that, wow, I carried the laundry upstairs. I'm just breathing a little harder than I used to. Oh, I'm just getting older. No problem. You know, I'll go back out in the shop and run my diesel in there. Um, chronic cough, we start getting that maybe just in the morning, kind of cleaning out the muck in the morning. And then pretty soon it starts to get a lot more frequent. And then you get tired faster. Um, you start having trouble with chores or doing stairs. So the burden in the US is, is very high. Um, it's still the leading cause of death in the United States. There's actually one death about every four minutes from COPD. There are 12 million with a diagnosis, and probably double that, you know, uh, you know, as we probably have had it for up to 10, 20 years until you're actually diagnosed. So we can probably double that. 50. 56 million hospitalizations just in 2019. So, and that's not including COVID. That's strictly for COPD. And then 23% if you're hospitalized with a COPD exacerbation, 23% chance you'll have to go back in within 30 days. It's difficult to get people out of an exacerbation once it's gotten that bad. 
And just in readmissions, we spend $49 billion in this country just on those readmissions. Um, Columbia County, we have a little over 4,000 in Columbia County. Uh, asthma, we have 325 people, 227 with COPD. Other adult lung diseases, bronchiectasis, um, old damage, things like that. And so that's actually about 1,000 people who may be affected by COPD directly, not to mention the stress on our families. Um, triggers, as some of you with COPD know, some days you're doing just fine, other days you're not doing well. You can't go over and see the neighbor because they have cats and that cat dander fires you up or your allergens, all those pollens during the certain time of year. Obviously getting an illness or an infection with COPD, even light asthma, you're gonna have a lot harder time. Um, extreme temperatures, we don't think about that, but when it's very hot outside or it's very cold outside, that affects the airways and can definitely trigger your COPD to get worse. Air pollution, we're gonna talk about the air quality index and we actually have a sensor right on top of the depot here in Dayton and you can put the air quality index on your phone and know if it's a good day to be outside or maybe ought to do that activity indoors that day. Um, also need to watch fumes. Your cleaning products, things that, you know, I love Pine Sol, but I, you know, if I had asthma, I might want to not use that one because it's very heavily scented. Even perfumes. If you've ever been trapped with somebody in an elevator who just put on like a gallon and a half of, even if it's Chanel number no. five, it's the good stuff, you can still set off somebody's um, uh, asthma or COPD. Molds and mildews, a lot of times in the summer when they harvest, you don't think of it, but the molds and mildews that have been under the wheat leaves all season long, it's dried out, we then pulverize that, and the dust is really full of molds and mildews. And then, of course, tobacco. So how do we prevent it? That's the hard part. Vaccinations can definitely help. Even if it doesn't prevent COPD, we know that COVID especially, pertussis, which is whooping cough, um, it can cause enough damage, a pneumonia can cause enough damage to tip the balance over into COPD. So we really want to avoid um, those bad things. So get those flu shots. That's why we uh, invited Columbia County um, Public Health. Prevention of colds and other viruses. I keep right clicking accidentally there. Stopping smoking, even if you think, gosh, I've smoked for 60 years. It can help to try to quit uh, smoking, it really can. Prevent those exposures to triggers. We included some scarves in with our COPD thing. A scarf over your nose and mouth when you're outside or even one of the annoying masks that we use. It keeps that cold air out and can really help prevent um, an exacerbation. Monitoring your air pollution. Um, I'll get a bigger slide with that in, but the air quality index can make a huge difference. Was that last summer, summer before last, when we had the big fires in, in Oregon? That was extremely unhealthy air. So yeah, that day was obvious, but we were actually in the very high risk category on some of those days. Most of the time we're lucky here, we're in the low risk, we're in the green zone, but we're gonna show you how to uh, get an app on your phone. And this is basically what it looks like. Now you'll see, today we're in the green, I just checked it this morning, I think we were 29. So we're in the green today, yay for that. Um, but all we need is that inversion layer where the cold air gets trapped down in the valley. People have got their wood-burning stoves going and in the middle of the night, that can go up fairly dramatically when we have these inversion layers in the winter. So keep your eyes on that. You'll notice under orange that it starts to talk about unsafe for sensitive people. Well, even personally, I thought, you know, the little guy down the street who wears his oxygen and the nebulizers, he's a sensitive person. Okay, come to find out everyone over 65 and everyone under 14 is a sensitive person. And all people with COPD, even asthma. So there's an awful lot of us in this room. There are actually sensitive people. So uh, we really need to watch that. So there's our green. Um, it's a great day to be outside. 
Um, all people were fine, but all COPD ears need to make sure they have their inhalers with them because you never know what might trigger an exacerbation. Yellow, all beware. Sensitive people consider reducing outdoor exertion. It's enough that sensitive people, young kids, our elderly, especially all of us with COPD, we should watch it. We need to be ready for that and say, well, maybe I'll go inside today. As it gets into the orange, this is unhealthy for sensitive groups. So this is when we start thinking about, do we want the little elementary kids out on, you know, running around and doing tag today? Or can we do, do something a little more quiet? Um, definitely keep your inhaler, do your nebulizer before you leave the house. Might not be a bad idea. When we get into the red, now we were definitely into the red um, that summer because of those wildfires. We were in the red, and we were in the red for some days. This means all persons should avoid long or heavy exertion and consider moving inside. COPD or sensitive, just avoid all activity outdoors. So we can really throw a, an exacerbation. Purple. Very unhealthy. We dipped into the purple during those wildfires a couple of times. Um, and I think especially two days, we really were. So, you know, almost everybody, even sensitive, avoid all physical activity. And, and if you have COPD, you need to stay indoors. You really do. And if you go out, wear a mask. One of those N95s can um, filter out. They're not comfortable to breathe in, and they're really not comfortable to walk in. But an N95 does um, get some of those diesel fumes, particulates, a lot of things out. So you, that is an option. And if we're in the maroon, everyone should stay indoors. And if you have COPD, you probably need to be very quiet, possibly even wear a mask indoors. We really hope we don't get in the maroon. So far, knock on wood, we've been doing OK. This is not a treatment option. It is. but. This is a ventilator, this is life support. Um, when we can't get you out of that exacerbation, we put you on a breathing machine. You can see by Tom Anderson's, he's got the, the pig lungs hooked up. So we don't want to get to this point. So we'd really rather start with medication. The majority of them are going to be inhalers. That's the best way to get it right into the lungs where it's effective. Um, also nebulizers, but we do have some oral um, medications as well. But that gets into steroids and antibiotics. As most of you know, your inhalers are really dang expensive these days. I mean, they just, it, I'm so happy that we've done something about the cost of insulin. This would be my next choice, um, is getting the cost of these inhalers down because they are ridiculous. And, you know, the new ones, Trilogy and some of those, they're great. You only have to do one puff. You know, once or twice a day, it's so much more convenient. But good grief, they're expensive. So nebulizers are the next way. That's those respiratory treatments. And um, Lincare has brought some of those uh, that can kind of even show you. That's the same thing that Tom does in the hospital. Um, we've got almost all the medications that we can get now. There's a few of the newer ones that we can't get. But if you're really having trouble and not being able to afford your medications, you know, join one of our programs. Let us know. Let your primary um, care provider know that you really can't afford those because we can usually get a nebulizer machine and we can get the components. It takes about 15 minutes sometimes to do it of respiratory treatment, so it does take up a lot of your time. But it is a um, less expensive option that we can get. Pulmonary rehab. The guys, I'm so proud of our respiratory, or, or, well, we love our respiratory department, but we have got an amazing rehab department. Um, you know, I've used it myself, and they are amazing. They think outside the box, and they are doing pulmonary rehab. And we think, why can that help? But the diaphragm is a muscle. The diaphragm is what pulls um, and opens it up and helps you suck that air in. And then we also use our chest muscles. We don't want to have to use those. But we do end up having to use those when we have COPD because the diaphragm needs a little help. So they're going to show us, um, as we break out into groups, they're going to show us some of the good breathing techniques. Just doing deep breathing every day, even if you just do five and really 
Use that diaphragm, use that expansion in there, kind of work that, that can even help. Not to mention, when we're not deep breathing, we're not <sighs> sighing every now and then, we're not mobilizing all those secretions that are stuck down in the airways. Um, action plans. Um, this is something that uh, we have been so blessed to be able to bring on board. Uh, we were able to, with Angela and myself, pro, uh, do some instruction on action plans. Um, it tells you what to do on any given day. So we're really trying to bring those in. They were developed by the American Lung Association. And um, we, can, we can really narrow that down onto, OK, good days and bad days. So there's an example in your handouts. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is the American Lung Association one. Uh, Jason was able to make us one that we could type in all nice and check the boxes and stuff. So if it's a green day, you're doing well. You feel basically at your baseline. That's as good as your COPD kind of ever does. You haven't had an asthma attack today. Um, so you're going to do all your usual prevention inhalers. Take your medicines, if that's antihistamines, whatever that may be. You're going to take those. Make sure you have your rescue inhaler around, but it's a pretty good day, yay for you. If we're in the yellow, we're starting to have a bit of a COPD flare. Maybe, who knows what, it's really cold outside. You just ran out to the mailbox this morning and that cold air was enough to kind of trigger things. So this is where we want to intervene. We want to increase the use of your inhaler or nebulizer. We're going to really try to hit opening up what's wrong. Is the lungs inflamed? Have they been triggered to kind of spasm? You actually have muscles in those airways that can spasm. So this is where, and it's really exciting before, we always said, this is your albuterol. This is your red inhaler. But nowadays, your inhaler like Simbacort, which is your daily prevention inhaler, it's got an inhaled steroid to decrease the inflammation, and it's got a long-acting air opener. We use those now as needed. So that's really something different because really albuterol doesn't fix anything, but it makes us feel better because it forces those, those airways open for a little while. But your combination, your Advair, Simbacord, um, several things like that, you can now use those on an as-needed basis. And your action plan will tell you when to do that. And that's why this program, so proud of Angela, because um, she'll go over these uh, action plans with people and know exactly what to do when they're not feeling well. And hopefully, we can really prevent. Um, there's also a place we're using rescue packs. What are we going to do when you go to the ER? Besides take a chest x-ray and you know, charge you a whole lot of money, and Tom's going to give you a nebulizer treatment, we're probably going to give you some steroid anti-inflammatories, prednisone or one of those. It's our mainstay of care, decreases inflammation in the airways. Hopefully, we can get those secretions moving. Um, and antibiotics. Do antibiotics fix your virus? No. Antibiotics do prevent kind of maybe going into a bacterial pneumonia. They also have something we don't understand, which is a little bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. So we're putting together rescue packs. One of the providers, like me or your primary care, would have a steroid pack and a, a, a moxicillin or azithromycin. You know when to use it, and that's what you're going to do when you're in the yellow zone. Once you're in the red zone, you're short of breath even at rest. All of your usual medications have not helped to resolve the issue. Um, things are going worse. That's where you need to go in. It's time to go in. Don't drive yourself if you're extremely short of breath and your oxygen saturation is 80. You might pass out at the wheel, and then you've got, you know, a, a Bambi runs out in front. That's a whole different ER visit that we do not want you to have. So same thing, doing well, those are our things. Exercise and diet, avoid your triggers, avoid smoking, use your daily inhalers. In the yellow, it's a bad day. You're going to use your quick relief meds, and you may start your rescue pack. And then in the red, you're short of breath at rest. You may have fevers, chills, chest pressure, or chest discomfort. That's immediate help. All right, we get to demonstrate some fun stuff with how to use your inhaler. 70% of people, we don't do them right. We don't. Um, they kind of had her mouth open. She's a little short of breath. She's anxious. Just had her mouth open and, and just made a little bit of a puff there. Yeah. 
What else did we do wrong? She didn't empty her lungs. Exhale. Exactly. She didn't exhale first. Even when she's short of breath, try to really exhale so that you can draw in enough to get it down into your lungs. Yeah. What else? Didn't breathe deep. Did not breathe deep. She barely gave it. She might have gotten all that in her mouth. <laughs> Maybe a little back in her pharynx, but it did not get in her lungs. It really didn't. Yep. And lastly, hold her it, exactly. She didn't hold her breath. Sometimes it'll make you cough just a little bit. That's OK. That's the medication getting down deep. So we also have some handouts, I think, um, over here that are um, proper ways to do that. Um, so yay, thank you. Nebulizers, they are a really good option. As I said, they're the same thing we use in the hospital. It's basically the same medication, but it's going into a vapor, and then you're just breathing it in and out over you know, anywhere from, what, 7 to 15 minutes, I guess, they, they take, depending on how uh, much medications. It seems like it would be crazy that something that good that we use in the hospital is actually cheaper. But it is, because your insurance is going to pay under Part B, I believe, for the machine and the tubing and all of that. And then we can actually get through Part B, the medications. So even if you have Part D for drugs, a lot of times the, the nebulizer or the inhalers are so expensive, most people have at least some Part B. And we can get these nebulizer. We, we can even get them sent to you. So um, that's where it's nice to have Fleur de Lis and, and Jennifer's name. Um, if they provide your oxygen and you even have a respiratory therapist you can uh, speak with as well. So they can be, um, we can order them via email. A lot of your pharmacies can do that. Um, they really are much more effective, especially if you have enough COPD that it's really, really hard for you to use an inhaler, even with an aero chamber or a spacer. That might be a better option for you. And especially if you're going through an exacerbation, even if you don't use that nebulizer machine for six months, but this time of year you seem to have problems, let's have one. Same medication as in the hospital. What's that? Oh, sorry. Um, and most of the medications are available. We have even steroid, which is the component in your Advair and your Symbicort and all of those. We can get budesonide. We can get the short-acting albuterol. We can get the long-acting components as well. Um, and really, the, the long-acting muscarinics, which are some of the new fancy ones like um, blank, spiriba. Um, we can't get those yet, but I think they're probably coming. Um, and thank you, and happy breathing. <laughs>